welcome to Gurukul Online Learning Networks Music Department's Sitara Classes. <clears throat> this is Nishid De. I am here to try and guide you, to help you learn, to help you explore, to help you initiate the journey of learning music through sitar as the medium. Before I continue, I should say it is virtually almost impossible to learn uh, classical music, something as deep as this, through video lessons only. I would highly recommend that you find yourself a guru, a coach, a teacher, or maybe a friend who could probably sit in front of you, who you will be able to experience to make this journey easier. But it is uh, since online, uh, things have been very different for the uh, past two or three years and these videos are there to guide you at least for the initiation or maybe till the intermediate stage of your journey. Today's first official class will have three main parts. The first part where we will discuss about the history of the sitar. The second part, we are going to dig deep into the anatomy of the sitar. And third, I'll try to give you some tips on how to get yourself a sitar. Without further ado, let's dive in. Starting with the history of the sitar, first and foremost, what I'm going to tell you has been passed down to me by my former generations, by my gurus, and I cannot guarantee, just like a lot of other people, that this in information here is 100% accurate. However, here's how the story goes. So in the 18th century, where it was considered to be uh, a very, uh, very important century for the development of music, mostly due to the invasions, mostly due to the way of life, uh, how things developed, the need for music, and so on and so forth. First and foremost, uh, in our part of the continent, uh, and I mean Southeast Asia, uh, people were extremely religious. And the most powerful uh, musical instrument was considered the human voice. In that way, it is by no means you cannot make an instrument that surpasses the abilities of the human voice, which kind of explains why you can't find an instrument that can play chords, because it is virtually impossible to make uh, chord-like sounds through the voice. Secondly, the kind of instruments that were produced back in the days were solely because of the necessity of having a background sound or something that could provide with an ambient sound for playback for behind music, uh, anything but being uh, the foremost uh, subject. Hazrat Amir Khusru was crowned to be uh, the inventor of the sitar. He was also crowned for a number of other instruments, including the tabla. Uh, back then, the sitar was looked very, very different. Maybe not the shape of it, uh, but the stringing system the materials used because it had a very different purpose. Uh, setar, popular belief, comes from the combination of two words of two languages. Se in Farsi or Persian means three and tar in uh, Sanskrit means strings, which means a three-stringed instrument. Back in those days, it was very true, but as soon as time went by and more uh, people studied sitar and instruments such as these and later in the last hundred years it reached its final form mostly by two amazing maestros who came up with two versions of this brilliant, uh, brilliant sitar one of them is the popular Pandit Ravi Shankar who plays who belongs to the Maihar Gharana who plays uh, Karaj Pancham sitar and the sitar I'm holding today in my hand was brought to life by Ustad Vilayat Khan, who belongs to the Imdat Khani slash Itawa slash Vilayat Khani Gharana. So as we understand the brief history of sitar, 
let's dig deep into the kind of sitar I am holding today. There are two main approaches to sitar music in uh, today's generation. One is Tantrakar Yang, which is also, which is uh, why uh, Pandit Ravi Shankar uh, has his fame for. He was a Tantrakar Yang musician, which basically lit, uh, it translates to instrumentalization. So at first, as I just mentioned, the all music, uh, the most powerful form of music was vocal music. It only makes sense that the instruments that uh, were trying to mimic uh, the vocal music had the vocal music as its base as its base so the instrumentalization of vocal music is one approach or as I, as i said the tantrakari yang and this other approach is gaik yang which was developed at least in the sitar by ustad vilayat khan gaik yang sitar is also known as gandhar pancham sitar and i'll tell you why in a in more details in a while but gandhar pancham just so you know all the seven notes, we Indian uh, or classical music uh, musicians, we don't change scales at all. We pick one root scale and the tonic of that very scale, we name the Sa and so on and so forth. We get seven notes and 12 in total if we include the minors and the majors. Uh, the Gandhar Pancham Sitar basically means that in any Sitar, you have the first string, which is the Baj or the main character the second string being the bass or jor and then you have gandhar which is also known as ga the third note in our kind of system and then you have pancham which is the fifth note so third and fifth if i were uh, showcasing today a uh, a courage pancham sitar the first two strings would remain common but then you would have courage which is also known as the lowest octave and then pancham, which again is the pa, but belonging in a different octave, which is much lower to this, the first octave, in fact. So that's a brief explanation. If you want, there were, however, attempts on sitar that took uh, different credentials from both the kinds of sitars, but none, uh, not most uh, have made it to that kind of acceptance. However, one or two names have to just have to be mentioned. One of them, them being Pandit Nikhil Banerjee, who was an outstanding sitar player himself. He chose this path of borrowing uh, the sustain from Ustad Vilas Khan sitar and yet maintaining the amazing sweetness of the tonal quality from that of the Mahar Gharana sitar. Uh, and then you have Ustad Halim Jafar Khan and then you have Pandit Debu Choudhury who have all different, uh, slightly uh, different versions of their sitar. More on that later. I would, I would highly recommend that you search these names up, know more about their music, and gradually learn more about the sitar. Coming back, this is a Gaiki Ang sitar, and now I'm going to explain to you parts of the sitar or the anatomy of the sitar. Before I continue, it is popularly believed that Vilayat Khan once uh, in Maimon Singh, Bangladesh, travelled to India after his father's death and was constantly searching uh, for a sitar that could really express his emotions. He was then met with, uh, with Kanai Lal Datta, who was a popular sitar maker at the time. And they too collaborated and eventually after many attempts, we have finally got the standard Vilayat Khani sitar, which has a standard shape, it has standard dimensions, stringing, frets, type of wood and everything else that follows. For the anatomy of the sitar, the sitar first and foremost that I do with uh, the uh, my, my people who I help learning the sitar, the first thing I usually do is I hand them the sitar because something as big as this looks a tad heavy. So quite naturally without uh, me telling them, uh, they try to pick up the sitar with all their strength and in instantly they find out that it's very, very light it's very light and that's mostly because the interior of the sitar is hollow just like most uh, stringed instruments it has to remain hollow so that the sound can travel so discussing the parts of sitar the first most interesting thing i find about the construction of a sitar is that the sound producing uh, box if i may is called is made from a gourd 
which is kind of like a flute uh, but which is kind of like a fruit it's it's kind of like a pumpkin uh, it's a huge pumpkin that's uh, widely cultivated in India not to eat just for the purpose of making uh, sitars and tanpuras so this is usually it is used to uh, for the sound to enter and kind of expand and that is going to give us the it is it is cultivated in different shapes and in different sizes then it has to sa be sanded down it has to be uh, it has to be kept away so that all the moisture goes away and it is processed in various ways the second part is actually one solid block of wood that has been hollowed out and the prices of sitar are usually besides the brand name and the and the craftsmanship that goes behind it is heavily dependent on the aging of this block of wood which starts from here goes all the way up to the top which works as the main fretboard and a ton of other uh, uh, acoustic properties of course the the number of years that the wood has been aged and of course the type of wood will kind of uh, it will kind of state the price of the sitar so for example if you buy a cheap sitar or, or a beginner sitar the chances are that this wood has not been seasoned well enough which is why the price of it is not much so that uh, uh, beginner sitar players could go and get one the second portion and the third portion actually are the frets so you it, when i turn it around you will be able to see that the frets are tied so naturally there could be a question that why is the frets not fixed so since you have all the tension of the sitar in one side the sitar retains amazing tension all throughout and in places like ours where we have five to six seasons in every season humidity is a huge problem humidity is always very bad for wood which is why the seasoning so every even though if you buy the most expensive sitar the, uh, the one with the most uh, seasoned wood chances are in every season uh, or even if you're sitting in a cold room or a warm room in sudden temperature changes there are chances that the frets are going to move just a little bit because there's a microscopic movement a microscopic bend in the sitar and you have to adjust for that which is why if you tie it up with strings the you can with a bit of force you can still tune the frets yes you heard that right you have to tune the, you have to tune the sitars and even the the frets if necessary and then comes the frets the frets are made of this material called german silver uh, it's this speci special material that they use for this it's it's stainless but in countries like ours it does have a layer of oxidation and you can buy chemicals to restore or you can just keep your sitar very clean and then i'm going to come to the strings of the sitar my sitar has 19 strings i have a sitar which has 18 strings and i also have a karach pancham sitar which has 22 strings uh, as I, as I said that you cannot play chords in the sitar, the question comes then why do I have so many strings? First and foremost, if you have ever heard a classical vocal performance, you are going to notice that there are a lot of instruments beside the vocalist uh, f to cover up the empty spaces. So you have the tabla player besides the vocalist, you have a harmonium player and then you have at least two tanpura players whose sole responsibility apart from their given responsibilities is uh, the to keep the environment very filled so we cannot hear any blank spaces uh, so we have a built-in tanpura kind of which we have the chikari starting from the bottom we have the main string which we call the baj the baj literally translates to the the player if i may because this string is solely responsible for creating a uh, melody in the sitar to create the ultimate uh, the ultimate uh, main character and this string is usually uh, tuned in the natural ma of the desired scale usually the sitar scale can range anywhere from c sharp to a maximum of d sharp the average sitar player would uh, usually play 
his or her sitar in D because that's considered to be the, just the right amount of sharpness in the sitar. But some rag, rags may, uh, may demand a lower scale just for that extra bass or some people even like a sharper tone which is why they would pick something like D sharp for example. I personally play in D. So having that said, we have the Shuddha Madham tuned in the baj string. Then you have the bass or the gravity which is going to hold it up all together. That's the jor. This is the jor. This is usually uh, this is usually tuned in the middle octave sa of the desired scale. In my case, it's D. And then you have gandhar, which we talked briefly about. And then you have pancham. And then you have these two interesting strings, which are going to give you that iconic sound that instantly reminds you of a sitar. So this single chord that all presents a D, uh, a D note, a D sa note, are supposed to work together. And the only separate string that is supposed to work separately is the baj string. So these are the primary or the top layer star strings. Then you have one interesting layer at the bottom, which is which we call the taraf string. So abiding by the law of resonance in physics, if you have, especially in a single body, if you tune two, uh, if you tune two uh, strings in the same frequency, you just have to play one to let the other resonate. So as as we all know or we are also going to know for the do those of you who don't know that yet, we follow ragas, which are essentially, if simply said, they, these are combinations of notes, which blueprint, if you follow, will portray the picture of a melodic scale. So having that information given, the whatever rag I'm supposed to play, I will have a corresponding note tuned inside the sitar through the, uh, through the, Mm, taros strings or the sympathetic strings and they will give that added sitar effect. For example, if I'm going to pull pa from here and you're going to listen to an extra sound that suddenly starts following, that is the taros. So, you hear that? That is the sound of the taros. Some sitar players, including I, we sometimes can use our pinky to kind of strum through all the strings, the tharavs and it's going to give you an effect similar to this. So that's it about the strings. Then you have the tuning pegs, which are these. So we have them in two groups. Usually if you can see that here we have two tuning pegs. One is just for show because it will probably look weird, but this is carried down from the previous sitar. We can also find a string attached to this in the Karaj Pancham sitar, but not in the Gandhar Pancham. You have the main uh, strings uh, tuning peg over here, and all the top layers are over here, the bigger ones. The smaller ones are here, and you start from Ni and you go all the way to Ga. Some, uh, when you change a rag, you'll know exactly what to do when the time comes. And then we have the bridge. This is an interesting, it is all string instruments have some sort of a bridge. The main idea behind a bridge, at least on the sitar, is to work like a, an audio filter. So it, when you play uh, any string and the, the, uh, the quality of the sitar, the craftsmanship will also come and play, but this would carry at least 30% of your overall tonal quality. So firstly, my bridge is made of ebony wood, but there are bridges from ivory which are banned, but they were considered to be the best kind of bridges, at least for you know, Vlad Khan style sitars. You have uh, celluloid bridges and they come in, uh, I think, three or four different types. But I, and of course, every bridge will have a different kind of a sound. My favorite is the black ebony bridge. And this happens due to the intermolecular density of every material that is used. So what happens is you stroke on the sitar, it vibrates, the strings, it, uh, since uh, wood can carry forward sound, it does that, it filters it through its intermolecular density, it's uh, through the legs, it goes down 
through the, uh, to the sound box of the sitar just like the guitar and expands and then you have the sound. My bridge is made out of ebony, uh, you can pick your one. Usually for students you have grade 1 celluloid bridges which are extremely difficult to cut and hence you are not going to have to maintain the bridge all the time. Then you have fine tuners, my sitar has one over here and two more over here. We will get to that in the chapter where we are going to explain tuning but these are really really necessary for fine tuning, they really help you out. And I believe that I have explained uh, all parts of the sitar. Now I am going to explain two very important things that we use to play the sitar with. So this is called a misrab. This misrab is made from stainless steel wires. You have fatter ones, you have thinner ones. It's really dis uh, it's really difficult to kind of explain uh, what kind of uh, misrab you should get. I would recommend you going to the store yourself and picking out a misrab and go for a, like a medium wear. That's going to give you the best kind of sound. Uh, then you have this tuner that we use all the time. So the frets, the, the tuning pegs uh, are still using the age old technique of friction to hold it in place. There are no gears, even though in modern sitars, which I personally don't like uh, for personal reasons, but they are good sitars as well. In modern sitars, you have gears installed here that will make uh, the turning much smoother. I like the traditional way and for this, so I have a magnified strength. I use this thurf tuner to tune the thurfs. And lastly, we have this, uh, this can that I use. You can, you can get a box or anything that you can put some cotton in and some coconut oil. It is very important that you don't use anything else but some kind of a non-sticky oil. Coconut oil is highly recommended. We use this to lube the sitar strings and our lines so there, are, there is lesser friction and ease of playing uh, will be gained. So this is pretty much about the anatomy of the sitar. Lastly, I would like to discuss on where you could, could get yourself a sitar. Getting a sitar, sitar being one of the most popular, uh, popular Indian classical instruments is not uh, difficult to get at all. You can find them if you are in India or anywhere from Southeast Asia, you could always travel to India and get one or you could just type in sitar makers and you have plenty of them in Kolkata and Miraj. Miraj is highly recommended. You could probably get one for around uh, let's say around five hundred dollars, or maybe thirty to forty thousand Indian currency. Five hundred dollars should be the sweet spot. You could get it delivered. You could find it online, and you could pick any kind of sitar. I would recommend to get a beginner sitar because the sitar journey is not very easy. So if it's for you, we can only find out. And sadly, there is only one way to find out for you to start your sitar. I would recommend Miraj and you could get a Gandhar Pancham Sitar just like I did or you could get a Karaj Pancham, whatever you get the training is going to be almost the same, at least the basics of it. Uh, I look forward to having more classes, I look forward to your mails, I look forward to making this uh, an amazing journey. Uh, in the next class we will learn how to hold the sitar and the posture. Till then, take care. Thank you. Bye.